talk about resiliency um, is still super important. Um, and so what uh, I've been looking at recently, uh, not only the, you know, heat has always been on my mind, but the idea that uh, there's some other things going on right now, like so much fewer, so much fewer, so, such uh, limited traffic on the highway has actually improved our air quality and in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, that'll probably rebound really fast, but I'm curious. Anyway, uh, that's just like for a future conversation, like how maybe um, uh, the short term air quality improvement might've had some sort of impact on your, uh, on your urban farms. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe we'll actually see it in the deposition on like in the soils potentially. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, Duran asked me to talk about um, uh, this, urban heat island thing that we've been working on for a little while and I'm going to share my screen see if we can make that work um and uh real quickly like I'm I've been talking about this for a long time and we've just recently published some interesting work about not just Richmond but the whole country and uh, uh now this uh started to find its way into a lot of different programs at the, at the city level and one of which I'll tell you about um, that if you want to continue the work outside of urban gardening um, and transfer, uh, you know, your skills are needed around the city um, by far. Uh, and so anyway, um, thank you so much, Duran, for allowing me to, to get a little bit of time with your folks. I wish we could do this in person because we usually play around with these little dollhouses and we actually get you to do a little bit of experimentation um, with the, the concept of uh, urban heat islands and how they impact not only that, but uh, stormwater and how your work amplifies that mission. So uh, I'll just quickly go over some stuff about heat and perhaps unsurprisingly, many of you um, are aware that there's this thing called climate change happening. And uh, it, it, what, what, this, what this does during the summer especially is to tilt the scales and, and load the dice for there to be much more frequent and intense heat waves. And in cities, looking at the most, the, the 50 largest cities in the country, we have seen an increase in the heat wave, the frequency of heat waves. So the, those bars getting bigger means that the frequency, uh, the number of heat waves per year has been going up. Uh, so too has the length of those heat waves. So not only are heat waves becoming more frequent, but they're actually physically longer in the number of days. They're actually more intense too. So like the temp, the the amount of temperature above a minimum threshold of say like, you know, 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 95 degrees Fahrenheit has been, we go above that for, for not only uh, more common heat waves, more longer heat waves, more intense heat waves, but then they're also happening at weirder times of the year. Um, so one of the things about this is that we might have, you know, some heat waves right now you're seeing them pop up in LA and, uh, this weekend it'll be 80 degrees, but we haven't had we haven't had a, a heat wave yet this year. But uh, in 2018 we had some uh, in May that were really um, uh, really significant, 90 degrees as early as May. So these things are all becoming more frequent, more intense, more longer in duration, and they're happening at weirder times. And the idea is that long term we might expect this to continue to happen. So. Um, this is a graph of the Southeast and you can see Richmond at the, you know, in, in, uh, in this little kind of darker color area uh, at the, uh, at the, you know, in the James River watershed. And un we are relatively fewer days um, uh, compared to our neighbors to the South, um, but there might be as many as 20 to 30 more days above or uh, at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, by the middle part of the century. So we're talking like 30 years from now, you know, uh, people experiencing a much more hotter, uh, you know, grosser feeling of summer for a lot longer time period. And this has impacts too on water availability for things like urban gardening. And so uh, soil moisture and, um, and you know, uh, retention will be challenged in a, in a time when you have such uh, longer, hotter air temperatures. Why does that matter to us as individuals and humans is that heat is the leading cause of weather related fatality uh, over the last like 30 years. More so than like flooding and tornadoes, which might come as a surprise because we tend to hear about these things on the news, these things like floods and tornadoes and hurricanes. We don't tend to hear about 
heat waves, although that is kind of changing now where um, last summer we actually did see some headlines even in Virginia about extreme heat. And so um, I grew up in uh, the suburbs of Chicago, Illinois in the 90s, and um, kind of the classic heat wave that uh, uh, is used and talked about a lot is the 1995 heat wave in Chicago. And um, the black line here is the air temperature. You can see it, it goes way above uh, 100 degrees for a couple days. And then it stayed above 95 for a few more after that. So this is really a gross, horrible heat wave event. And you can see this red, the red um, curve here is the mortality, people suffering uh, uh, death in the event of the, after a few days after the, the, the uh, lead of, of temperatures. And that's because many of the places that impacted, uh, that were impacted by this heat wave were areas of the city that people were afraid to open their windows. Um, there, many times they're in the elderly, uh, communities of color in the city of Chicago, um, where at this time, based on many years of white flight and disinvestment, that these communities have become very fragmented and uh, didn't have a lot of resilience in the sense of there weren't a lot of people going around to check on these folks to make sure to maintain their health and provide them any sort of uh, you know emergency services. So this picture is really like uh, really uh, uh, meaningful to me. I remember. Um, this picture in the Chicago Tribune uh, being very powerful and uh, 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 representative of the type of people that were uh, experiencing this heat wave differentially. I was only, you know, uh, I was a, 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 you know, like 10 years old uh, and we had, uh, you know, a white privileged kind of upbringing, middle class. I had a baby pool in the backyard. We had air conditioning. I remember even having people over at my house for a yard party and it was like beat the heat, you know, with our neighborhood association. So I experienced a very different reality than what was going on just on the other side, not even 10 miles, 15 miles away from where I was growing up. There were significant um, disparity playing out right in front of our eyes. So when we look at what goes on here in Richmond a little bit more, or at least shifted into Virginia, what I'm going to show you is, is along the bottom here is like the temperature at the airport. So to the right is really, really hot. Those are days when nobody wants to be outside up on this graph is a relative percentage of people getting sick due to heat related illness. Turns out we don't have a lot of directly attributable deaths to heat in Virginia. Um, most of the time, the only directly attributable deaths to heat are unfortunately children that are left in vehicles. Um, but uh, it, 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 we do see a significant portion of our uh, population succumbing to heat related illnesses. And so, um, if you think about what this graph might look like, so up on the Y axis is more people getting sick and temperature going up on the right. You can kind of have a mental image of what this graph already looks like in your head. And maybe you're thinking something that looks a little bit like this, or you know, maybe something like this, a dog leg. It is actually a dog leg, which means that above about 95 degrees Fahrenheit, we have more and more people getting sick uh, at an increasing rate. And we've been all, uh, we're seeing a, a graph like this kind of playing out uh, over the last several weeks during the COVID-19 crisis, where we've had this exponential growth in cases. The same thing happens uh, during uh, extreme heat waves uh, here in Virginia. And in 2019, actually, over a thousand people had to go to the emergency room for heat-related illnesses in July alone. So that's a thousand people suffering a completely preventable illness uh, in, in, in the course of just one month in the state of Virginia. Um, so what I want you to do is in the chat room, I know we think we have a, a, an access to, the, to a group chat or something like that. If you want, put into the chat room in this picture, because we know heat doesn't affect everywhere the same way, put into the chat if you can use it, um, where, do you think, where do you think the hottest place to the touch? Or why don't we all say, on three, unmute your microphones, and we'll say on three, say out where you think the hottest spot to the touch is on three, okay? One, two, three. Pavement. The parking lot. The parking lot. Parking lot. Parking lot. Roof. Nice, okay, good, good, good. All right, now on three, I want you to tell me where you think the coolest spot is to the touch on three, okay? One, two, three. 
Underneath those trees. trees. Um, um, sitting area. The grass. <laughs> Underneath <laughs> the trees. Yeah, that's great. So Under what I love. Air condition. Thank you so much. Um, what I love about this image is that we can investigate so much about what the whole rest of the story is about just from this one picture. And so what I heard from many of you was something about like these, the parking lot or the cars or the rooftops um, indicating to me that there's like something about the color or the material. And then on the flip side of that, many of you said on the coldest areas or the coolest areas are gonna be something more like the grass or the green or the trees. And what we can do is use a thermal camera to actually show us where those places are. And so by looking at uh, the uh, actual thermal image coming back to a, 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 an infrared camera, we can see that the coolest temperatures are underneath that tree. They're only about 87 degrees to the touch underneath the tree. In the middle of this bright spot here in the, in the parking lot asphalt, that's about 175 degrees Fahrenheit to the touch. You can basically, you can basically cook an egg on the asphalt. Um, <laughs> Now, what's interesting about this is that there's a bunch of other things going on. Like, um, I'm going to annotate some things. I love this little tool. So, like, look here at the, the grass here and the, the non-native European grasses. Those are just as warm as the sidewalk right next to them because they don't have very deep roots. Whereas the native plant garden here uh, in the Bayscapes Garden at the Science Museum of Virginia are all uh, native plants. And with their really, really deep root systems, they're able to tap into uh, to, uh, sources of water that the grasses aren't getting. And so this is actually a really cool way to say native plants are going to be the way to potentially keep vegetation a little bit cooler and uh, definitely not create an artificial sidewalk. Um, and then what an interesting thing is to look at these uh, the different colors of the cars and how uh, a dark colored car versus a light colored car can have very different temperatures coming back to the uh, to the to the sensor as well. So to go go backward one, uh, you know, we have the white van and the red car right next to each other, and you can see how different those colors are. So it, what what's really amazing is just from this one picture, we can learn a lot about how if you can think in your head, where what does the city? How has our city been designed? And if you zoom out towards like you know in your head, like zoom up in the, in the um, Google Maps and look down at the city uh, based on what we learned from just this one photo, uh, you know, you can start to imagine what kind of conditions might exist across the city during a, during a heat wave. So um, when we look at this from space, almost every American city has some sort of uh, urban heat island effect. Um, you know, this is really the, the United States of urban heat islands. Most of the time we see these things, thermal cameras that are on satellites in space, but what we can do and what we did here in Richmond back in 2017 was to actually go out and like use a thermometer uh, attached to cars that are taking a measurement of where we are in the city as well as the temperature that we're experiencing all at the same time. And my, co my colleague Vivek Shandas is our, the, the main um, genius behind this work who designed these little you know, what look like uh, sports car flags, but instead of, um, instead of uh, showing your support for a team, it's showing your support for science. <laughs> so we worked, um, we worked with a bunch of really cool organizations in town and I didn't know uh, Duran well enough yet uh, to get him involved in this work at the forefront, but we've worked with them ever since. Uh, but one of the groups that I wanted to tell you about was actually the RVA Green 2050 team. Alicia Zakoff and Brianne Mullen, actually I should add a new picture in here. Kendra Norell is now um, a, a member of their team. And if you go to rvagreen2050.com, you can sign up for their program, which is called the Digital Ambassador Program. And they're trying to engage with communities all over the city of Richmond uh, on climate action um, uh, over the next you know, year or two years. Even in a post-COVID world, we're still going to need to make more of these um, changes permanent you know, through uh, policy and recommendations from things like the Richmond 300 plan and stuff that Duran and I have and several others the city have been contributing to over time. But they were a part of the program from the very beginning, as well as the Groundwork RVA group, which I'm sure you've heard about Groundwork RVA. Mm -hmm. uh, Kendra uh, was working for them when we first met her, um, and Giles Harnsberger, who's now at the Parks Department, uh, is uh, were the people that helped in the campaign back in 2017. But now Melissa Guevara and Rob Jones 
uh, are, are helping us out long term with this project um, to a thing that we call shade. Um, but the, uh, Rob Jones and, and Groundwork RVA and the Science Museum of Virginia were awarded a, 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 Metro, a Metropolitan Business League Award for partnership innovation through this work. So we're really thrilled that, um, that we were able to get some rec uh, recognition for this organization. But it's seeking to green Richmond and pre pre prepare youth for success and realize racial equity in this city. It's only going to uh, get clear as we go on that there's um, something very uh, particular about that. But, this is a Jana. She's actually using that car flag of science um, on the, uh, the car during a heat wave in 2017. We went out, we had 16 cars drive around the city, and we discovered a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place on the exact same time during the same day. So this is 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place at the exact same time. Just within a couple miles of one another, you can have a very different heat wave experience. Just like what I uh, went through when I was growing up in the city of Chicago, that same thing is playing out right here in the city of Richmond. And when we look at what the health burden is on, of this, you might ask yourself, well, does this heat actually mean anything to public health? And so we worked with the Richmond Ambulance Authority to figure out where they go to the most for heat-related illnesses. What's amazing about these two maps, they look basically identical, but they're showing two different things, heat and heat-related illnesses. So it's pretty amazing that this agreement exists in two independent sets. Um, but what, uh, what's really amazing is when we start looking at the people that live in these areas. So if we know something about the, the neighborhoods, we can say something a little bit more, uh, more informed about the, the, the policies potentially in the future. So I'm going to show you this triangle. And in the triangle, there's going to be a bunch of these bubbles. And if the bubble is really big, it means that there's a strong relationship between two uh, uh, variables, between like census data about the types of people that live in those neighborhoods and like the heat in that neighborhood. Furthermore, if they're white relation, if they're a white bubble, that means that they're positively related, meaning that as one goes up, the other one goes up. So as like uh, say like public transportation use goes up alongside something like. Uh, people that rent their houses. That's a positive relationship. A negative relationship would be like if something is going up and then another one is going down. So this has to do with the size of the circle and the color of the circle. And what this uh, what this really shows us is by looking at all these different variables about who lives in these areas, higher temperatures at 3 p.m. in the city of Richmond, uh, you're more likely to be black, suffering uh, from socioeconomic uh, uh, limited resources resources. You're going to be living around more vacant properties, that kind of idea of like disjointed neighborhoods. You're probably taking some form of public transportation to get to and from work. So you're actually probably walking through that experience a little bit more than other people. Um, and just like anything, there's really low canopy. It's by far the biggest uh, predictor of of temperature in areas across the city is the amount of trees. And we learned that from that picture I showed you before. Um, on the flip side, at cooler temperatures at 3 p.m., you're more likely to live in a neighborhood that is predominantly white, very low uh, uh, rates of poverty, many more occupied houses. People tend to drive their own cars to work. Um, they have more canopy, they have newer houses, and it tends to be like an older population. So what, what, what is it about this that, uh, that when we start looking at these these patterns what can we say about like the history of the city that really aligns with this so i'm going to show you some other maps this one is uh is a the darker the color means the higher the tree canopy the opposite of this is that uh where the area is a very low canopy they have very high amounts of built environment or impervious surfaces um, you can also see that there's a spatial Dependence. This is the color of money map, where the darker greens are, are wealthier parts of the city, and the lighter greens are uh, folks with more limited resources. And um, when we combine some of those things into an idea of what maybe like heat vulnerability looks like, we look at we look at a map that looks like this. You might have seen this before uh, in in some city documents or people presenting on this uh, throughout the city over the last few years. But what started to pop out to several of my uh, uh, colleagues, including Duran, because I think it was actually, Duran was the first one to look at the, at the heat map and he said the block is hot, which I still try and use 
uh, at every opportunity, uh, even though it sounds a little awkward from a white guy with glasses. Um, <laughs> I just try and own it uh, a little bit. Um, but so, so I'm showing you here the, the redlining map of the city of Richmond. And in the 30s, the federal government made it legal for these uh, property assessors to basically come into a neighborhood and rate the neighborhood along a spectrum of perceived safety for financial investment. But really it was along racial and ethnic lines where uh, areas that were predominantly communities of color and low, uh, uh, like uh, in, in newly um, settled ethnic populations were given lower ratings and assigned these red polygons. Here in Richmond, almost all of the neighborhoods that were given uh, red polygons were predominantly communities of color. And the ones immediately around them were almost more likely to get rated something like a C rating uh, or that yellow border, just because of being in the same general area as these communities of color. So this is a very um, uh, clear indication that the history of Richmond, at least many of these cities, you might recognize some of their names like Newtown East and Carver. Um, those are some, those are some uh, uh, still predominantly African-American communities in the city of Richmond to this day. And so when you start looking at the impacts of, we wanted to ask the question, and I wanted to test Duran's hypothesis, is the block really hot? And in fact, it was, uh, definitely. Um, it, the areas that were redlined in the 30s have a significantly warmer temperature today. Now, this is uh, uh, something that then we wanted to follow up and ask the question, well, 239 other maps were drawn in the 30s in uh, 108 other cities around the country. And so when we started to look at some of the other outcomes of research about the redlining, what I'm gonna show you is house value since um, 2000 uh, in the different rating categories. So up on this graph is gonna be more house value and to the right is gonna be the more recent time period. Perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, house values have remained higher in the green lined areas than in the red lined and the yellow lined areas through, through time. This is a study that was done by Zillow. Surprisingly, and it's really, really interesting by city. Um, this, is a, this is one that looks at, remember we were just talking about those circles in that triangle and how lower income and higher, uh, po or, um, higher populations of uh, communities of color is playing out in Richmond in these hotter areas. Well, same too in nationally in these redlined areas, they tend to be low to moderate income areas of cities in formerly redlined areas, and they tend to be predominantly communities of color. To this day, redlining, even though it might not have forced people to live there, it made it law to keep these neighborhoods in place. And in many ways, they didn't end up enjoying the same amount of investment that other neighborhoods in the same city might have enjoyed. And so um, this is also now playing out. The flip side of this is gentrification. In the city of Portland, Oregon, places that were redlined and given the C or, or the yellow line designation are more likely to have been gentrified over the last 30 years than, uh, than their non-redlined counterparts. Uh, we don't know this for sure uh, in Richmond from data, but in some basic analysis, we know some places like Church Hill, uh, especially closer to you know, um, uh, uh, like Chimborazo Park and everything, have seen significant rates of uh, displacement and gentrification versus other uh, communities uh, in the same city. So this same story is playing out in many different cities. So we wanted to ask, well, what about um, uh, uh, like the, the temperature. So let's go back to that. So I'm gonna show you just quickly, here's the redlining map, here's the temperature map. By temperature, uh, temperatures go up as you go back or as you go down in the grades from A to D or red or green to red. Then when we look at the tree canopy, there's a significant drop off in the amount of tree canopy by those redlining designations. So redlined communities here in Richmond today, lower tree canopy than their non-line, red-lined counterparts. And they see, much like what I hinted to before, much more impervious surfaces in these areas than in their uh, non-red-lined counterparts. So it's like a, a clear story of having less environmental benefit um, and more disproportionate climate change exposure, potentially related to a, red line, a, a, a federal law from almost 100 years ago. So we wanted to ask, does this play out in every city around the country? And yes, 
in uh, 94% of the cities that were redlined in the 1930s, there is a trend towards hotter temp temperatures by neighborhood classi classification. That's crazy. It turns out that it breaks down a little bit like weird by the, by the, um, by which part of the country you're, country you're in with the South having one of the largest differences bet between the red line and non red line communities. This plays out also in the avail availability of tree canopy and in the, and in the preponderance of the impervious surfaces. So basically what I'm showing you here is that what we observed in the city of Richmond is going on in over 95% or 94% of all of the other cities that were redlined in the 30s. So why does this matter in some other ways? Some amazing research that was just published a couple weeks after our paper on temperature and redlining found something else that is important for the impacts of COVID-19. Is COVID-19 a respiratory illness? What I'm gonna show you here is a different study looking at by the HOLC risk grade or the from the A, the green, green line neighborhoods to the red line neighborhoods or the D rated neighborhoods. We're gonna look at the emergency department visits due to asthma. You might, so you might think in advance that, yeah, there are more, and it's true, there are more people going to the hospital for asthma related emergencies in formerly red line neighborhoods in cities in California. We don't know this yet for the state of Virginia, but we do know uh, uh, relationships between exposure to air pollution in uh, the Northeast that uh, uh, non-white communities are, dis are uh, disproportionately exposed to precursor emissions and air quality that actually uh, exacerbate asthma attacks. So what we don't know for sure that this applies across Richmond and across the East Coast, I'm fairly you know, confident that we're gonna continue to see these relationships about redlining and the long-term impact of these uh, on the long-term climate readiness and resilience of the um, So why does that relate back to COVID-19? Well, because we've seen already in the city of Richmond that disproportionately color are being, are being affected by COVID-19. And that's a respiratory illness. One of the predispositions for being affected by COVID-19 is having asthma. So all of this seems to relate back to one another in that we need to be improving of communities that have experienced disproportionate uh, uh, impacts from these uh, ways that keep people uh, economically disadvantaged through time. And so what do I think that looks like? And you might think, uh, you know, your work has a whole new meaning now. I hope that this in some ways has inspired you to think that greening is part of the solution that it is. Um, we know that going from these areas that are dominantly impervious services, formerly redlined areas. If we were to choose projects and invest in community programs and projects that actually increase the amount of pervious surfaces through, um, you know, garden plants, uh, uh, green infrastructure in the form of native plants and trees, as well as just like rainwater harvesting techniques, like green roofs uh, and, and uh, cisterns, that we can actually reduce temperatures during heat waves we can absorb more storm water and we can potentially improve the air quality. So um, in any case, I just wanted to bring all this up um, uh, and share with you some of the findings and, uh, and I'd be happy to, to have a conversation with you about what all this probably means. Um, I saw Nick, Nick asked a question, how do we compare to other cities of similar size that don't have a big river wetland system running through it as far as the heat island effects? Um, so uh, yeah, so um, that's a good question. So the river um, has actually a lot less to do with air temperatures right nearby it um, than say the exposure. Uh, so a river, a river without a lot of shade around it is, can be a very hot river. <laughs> In fact, 
rivers and streams across Virginia have warmed up faster in some ways than the air temperatures uh, in, in Virginia, because as we expose them to, to, to the sun's energy directly through removing riverside buffer systems and natural environments around the uh, rivers, it's actually, we uh, uh, can increase the temperature of the water, which then feeds back on the temperature of the air. So it's uh, the, the location and in, in nearbyness to the river actually had a very low impact on the observed temperatures. It had much more to do with nearby expanses of impervious surfaces and tree canopy than it did about the location relative to bodies of water. Um, but as far as other cities of similar size, um, you know, uh, uh, we're, we, we have, you know, kind of a, a, um, a common, I would say like a pretty average um, uh, uh, difference between those formerly redlined and and non and uh, redlined communities in as much as their difference across landscapes. Uh, in the other cities that we've done this in, Baltimore, DC, Boston, um, uh, Portland, Oregon, it all seems to be somewhere between about 15 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Fahrenheit of the difference between like the coolest and warmest place at the same time. It doesn't seem to be very much related to the overall sprawl uh, or size of the city. It has much more to do with the that balance of the huge impervious surface areas versus the really like shady parks. Do other people, that's a really good question though. Does anybody else have, have questions related to this? We know that money is a great incentive to get action. The city of Richmond has monetary incentive to plant rain gardens and harvest rainwater. Have you found that cities across the US have these incentives and is it publicized? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, that's a, you know, um, we do have a little bit of an incentive. It's what, what I, uh, and if you don't know this, you know, you do have a, a way to, to mitigate your stormwater fees by practicing stormwater harvesting at your house or at your business. And I don't think a lot of people know that even in Richmond. And if they do, there's a little bit of a barrier to it because you have to fill out the paperwork every single year and you have to have someone come out and like, make sure that you're doing it right and all that, you know, it's just, you know, it's, so it becomes a little bit of a, uh, too much of a responsibility, I think, on, on, the, on the individual who's trying to have a good impact. That's just my personal opinion of that program. I do think it's really important to save, uh, to, to harvest rainwater and get paid back on the stormwater fees for it, absolutely. I think we could be doing a much better job of publicizing it even here in Richmond. Um, I will say that the city of Chicago, because I, I, I just, I love that city because it's kind of where I'm from. Um, they have actually worked with community in the west side of Chicago. What they've been doing is a program called their Resiliency Corridor Program. And they've been actually working with community leaders and community uh, 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 organizations to develop the greening plans for particular like community uh, hubs in west side Chicago. Um, and so they are very much like going directly to the community, figuring out what the best way to manage stormwater and to provide community benefits is, and then allowing the community to publicize it uh, amongst themselves. It seems to have been very, very popular and very uh, um, uh, uh, like impactful in the short time that it's been going on. Um, but uh, Philadelphia is another city in the country that has done a lot related to um, stormwater and harvesting uh, stormwater. Um, but what's interesting about that program is by incentivizing um, developers and groups to make new housing with these green infrastructure solutions as part of their designs, what they've inadvertently done is to then displace the communities that are living in those disproportionately vulnerable areas through what a process known as green gentrification. Um, so it's like when you wanna do a good thing, uh, sometimes that can result in an unintended consequence of displacement, whether that's unintended or subtly intended in some ways, I think as well. So um, I, think, I think that there's, we still have a lot to learn. And I think um, in Richmond, we could be, uh, and I think as part of like Richmond 300 and the RVA Green 2050 plan, I think that that idea of incentivizing these, these good 
uh, practices of stormwater mitigation and potentially even heat island mitigation, we might see more and more of that being used to inspire community action uh, and, and backyard, uh, backyard projects. Um, Duran might actually have something to say about that too. I don't know, Duran, if you have anything to input about the stormwater fee stuff or uh, other cities that you've seen. Well, I mean, the city does have um, money that they have to, well, the city is mandated to address stormwater management federally. Uh, so, like, they have to uh, do stuff to address the combined sewer system. And uh, green infrastructure is one of the things that the city has been willing to pay for in order to, you know, address the issue. So, rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, um, tree planting, uh, native planting, mm, I guess maybe yeah, not so, so much, so but, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, the folks over at uh, DPW or uh, RBA H2O, you know, they have a, a regional meeting that they, that they do with folks from Chesterfield and Henrico. And they, you know, my experience has been, if you reach out to the city, about doing something that will mitigate stormwater, then they might be able to give you some money to do it, like or at least buy the stuff that you need to do it. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. They the, the the rain barrel. That's another thing that we usually do in this program is to get rain barrels to all the participants. Hopefully, someday we'll be building rain barrels again. I know, uh, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, Anya had a good question too. How do we get um, the city to make sure of an effort to plant and care for trees, reduce the heat island effect? Um, and planting a tree in the city sounds quite tricky, and it is. Um, to, get a, to get a permit to plant a tree is kind of crazy. Um, and uh, so right now, actually, the, the, the city um, forester, uh, or the, the, um, the person that oversees the tree ordinance, uh, is actually retiring. So we have, we have an opportunity in the city to, to hire a person in charge of that, like, program that could potentially be very much like agreeable to updating the tree ordinance. We haven't had a new tree ordinance since 1992. Um, so we, we haven't really updated our uh, plan for uh, our urban canopy for a long time. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's definitely time for us to make it easier to plant trees. There is a recommendation in Richmond 300 uh, for increasing the city's urban canopy to 60%. Um, and what would be amazing is to see a lot of that um, imp tree improvement going on in the communities that need it the most. And more importantly, the communities that really want it, <laughs> because I think in some ways, uh, uh, you know, just showing up and planting a tree in front of somebody's house can be a little bit problematic. Um, and so I think it's got to be something that comes from, uh, from the community. And, and this uh, speaks to... Uh, uh, the next question is that could fruit trees be planted to help feed the, the homeless population? And, you know, actually, um, this is part of what the, the uh, throwing shade program with our Groundwork RVA, uh, the, the first group of students that we worked with to do this actually decided to plant fruit trees, not only to provide themselves with fresh fruit, food uh, in the flowering season, but to do uh, that very thing and to provide food uh, of um, uh, like local fruit um, uh, to their community. So I think that there's, what you bring up in that question is this idea of co-benefits. We need to be thinking about how your urban gardening programs are benefiting more than just, you know, your backyard garden. It's improving and keeping, um, uh, uh, yeah, stacking those functions, absolutely. As many uh, things going on, pollinator habitat, stormwater management, heat island reduction, air quality improvement, uh, you know, food, uh, food justice, all of that stuff is part of uh, a more resilient and climate ready community in the future. And um, I think it's just like, it's, it's so cool to, to, um, to know that there's work and people thinking about this um, out in the out in the community. Um, so, does it, do people have other other questions? I don't know how much time we have, Duran, and, and whether we're uh, whether we're getting close or not. Uh, look, so we um, we typically well the call typically goes till nine, but you know. Oh yeah, so we'll just give it like 
for about an hour. But I mean, you know, we just feel free. To Here, I'll actually bring talk. it back up like this because I think it's just better to have everybody on the on the uh, um, the the layout view. So um, the question: uh, Would there be any parties that might not be on board with a vision like that? So, uh, and I don't want to I don't want to mispronounce your name. Can is it Kenyatta? Um, yes, you got it. Kenyatta. All right. I just want to make sure I, that I'm not uh, mispronouncing. Um, uh, and so, so um, interesting in the city of Baltimore, um, when they went about their update to their tree program uh, about 10 years ago, um, a colleague of mine was helping out in the climate resiliency office in the city of Baltimore. And um, much like the city of Richmond, Baltimore has this long lasting imprint of, of, of redlining. Um, and they, instead of it being like this kind of clustering of, of red line communities kind of around uh, uh, like we have, I, it's not really a, a clear shape, but in Baltimore, they call it the black butterfly. And it's oh, like wow. these, the east and west edges of the city um, experience this, the, like these same patterns that we see playing out in Richmond. And so they had a targeted tree planting program where they were trying to engage with members of, that, of those communities. And many people in those communities were saying, well, trees promote crime by giving uh, people a place to hide. Then, um, it, then two, I don't want birds pooping on my car or uh, like tree limbs falling on my car. Now, or, or, or the sidewalk will get broken up by the roots. That is a really hard uh, thing to counter. How would you how would you go about engaging with somebody that told you those three things? What would you tell them uh, uh, about your tree program that <laughs> that would dispel um, those feelings? Well, if you're asking me, um, I would say I wouldn't plant it in an area like um, that's near a sidewalk. Um, there are a lot of places in the city that are currently um, abandoned or um, plots of land um, where they could be planted. You know, um, there are nonprofits they could help manage it. It doesn't have to necessarily be in a location that is um, close to the street, not the cars. So that's how yeah. I, I would look at it. Well, that's really, really a good way to, to, to think about it, Kenyatta, because that's actually ended up what they had to do was the problem with Baltimore's tree planting program was that they were just showing up to people's houses and saying, hey, this tree. For you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so there, the lesson learned there was exactly what you're saying is we need to have community vision as part of these programs. So I really don't think that anybody would be against it if we did it the right way. And if we started to think about where are those vacant properties, where are those um, uh, stretches of little, little triangles of empty grass that we could be filling out with, uh, with, shade, with shade trees and those sorts of things, or fruit trees in, in many cases. I mean, I don't see, I don't see as long as we have buy-in from the community, how any of these situations, any of these problems, or plans could truly be something that we can't all look at and say, wow, you know, this, this reflects what I think. Um, and so uh, we would be, part of that would be addressing those issues. So um, that's a great input. I, you're exactly right. Let me, I'm going to jump in real quick and just say that in 2019, uh, we planted uh, over 190 fruit trees and shrubs uh, across the city. Um, and the year before, I know it was in excess of 100. So since the program you know, with the garden was an inception, you know, close to 300 fruit trees have been planted at various uh, green spaces uh, all across uh, the city. And so, you know, <laughs> we did get funding from, you know, different sources, but one was the city of Richmond. You know, we were able to secure a grant uh, through non-departmental funding uh, for 2018 and 2019. That allowed us to not only do the training program, but like literally like plant trees and uh, gardens and green spaces. So I think that, you know, that alternative to street trees, you know, the city's gardening program is one where folks can like identify parcels of vacant city property and, you know, 
go ahead and, and, and do to do. And it might also be a conversation again with RBA H2O or DPU to say, hey, you know, we know you got the stormwater mitigation mandate. How about, you know, we collaborate and you give us a thousand dollars worth of trees. Uh, you got the program over at the Richmond Tree Stewards where they're giving folks uh, community trees. Um, I think it's called Community Roots, right? That's the name of the program. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there, there's so many different ways to, to do this. And there's, it's, it's really just about, you know, tapping in. And, 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 and I will also add, I love trees. And I think they're an amazing, actually, I, I prefer to do trees than I do prefer doing raised beds and things. But there's also a hell of a lot of roof space in the city of Richmond. If you go on Highway 95, when you cross the uh, train station, uh, look, just look to your right. It's like a sea of white roofs. Um, and DC, DC has a, a cent incentive program for green roofs, where people are actually like, you know, it's, you know, they're, it's promoted. Like, yo, turn yeah. your roof into a green roof. That, uh, what if we had that in Richmond? You know well, what the I mean? roof, roof, they're, they're, it's, it's so strange because I think, um, you know, so DC is, a, is, is an area that has really uh, bought into the green roof thing, but, mm -hmm. it, but not quite like rooftop agriculture. And yeah, right. I, I, I wonder why, uh, you know. Yeah, you, me too. Um, it's just, I, I, I think it's, I mean, who knows, but any, I can't speculate, you know, you, you know more about the food systems in other cities than I do and, and the agriculture programs. And like, you know, I think I've seen it a lot more as like, you know, those like uh, extensive green roofs, which are just like low lying succulents as a stormwater mitigation measure than, um, than for, for food, um, which is, which is, which is a, sh a shame. I mean, I live, I live in Scott's edition, and we basically only have a uh, black roof, one floor, giant old factory buildings that uh, were, you know, figuratively and literally the hottest neighborhood in the, in the, <laughs> in the city. And uh, we could do really well to have some of that green roof stuff going on, but uh, can't convince we, we, And this gets back to what Kenyatta said earlier is that the money talks. And if there's an incentive to do these things, then people will. And so if we could figure out, and I think even in for, for the sense of agriculture, we wouldn't need to give you any incentive. We would just need to be able to allow you to do it <laughs> and, and people would, you know? So um, I, I don't know. Um, anyway, the, Ariel had a question. Um, more of these gentrified areas and new developments do not have permaculture and greening initiatives. Me too. Um, you know, I think, uh, uh, I think that one of the things that, we just kind of missed like going into the, um, the rezoning of like the, the pulse corridor and some of the areas that have been allowed to be more dense was that in the rush to even just be able to get more density. Um, we, we didn't make it any, we didn't make it harder and say, well, we also need public green spaces as part of those things. And so I think what you'll see actually, Ariel, over the next couple of years is this discussion happening in places as they continue to rezone Monroe Ward and places around, you know, um, where we just have bunches of surface parking lots that we can turn into places for people to live and grow food. You'll see that discussion come back up. And I think um, uh, being a part of that conversation is going to be really important. And I think you can do that through the RVA Green um, Ambassador Program. RVAgreen.com and, and check out their part Ambassador Program. If you get involved in that same way. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, uh, and, but there is the Mayor's Green Team too. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, some other really interesting stuff going on really quickly. Um, I'm part of a working group uh, for the city that's trying to determine city owned parcels of land um, uh, that, so, you know, stuff that the city already owns, but aren't doing anything with. 
So much like what you, many of you brought up is just like these vacant areas. Sitting there fallow, not doing anything, or many times just growing kudzu, which is- Right, um, it's the same, right. <laughs> and so, so um, the mayor uh, had a, a goal for 2020, which you know, I think we're still on this goal, even though there's a very much more serious thing in hand. Um, but the, gre the green team was put together to determine um, where the best climate resilient parks and green spaces with the opportunity for permaculture and agriculture to go on, uh, predominantly in the south side of the city. And so we, we are in the process of making our like recommendations right now. And some of the really cool properties that are coming up are um, nearby where Richmond 300 sees like activity zones in the future. So where we could see like new neighborhoods kind of popping up and uh, and, and as long as they're planned the right way and they're, and people are brought along for the process instead of getting displaced, could be really, really beneficial to long-term communities, um, you know, around like Bellmead, Oak Grove, um, and uh, Broad Rock. Um, it's one of the really cool properties that is going to be, I think, just absolutely lit in a few years. Um, it, it's got so much space. Duran, I showed you that on the satellite map. Um, that has just like such total um, potential for really amazing stuff to go on. So, um, you know, uh, be on the lookout for uh, kind of really cool uh, announcements about new green spaces and potentially opportunities for you all to start your own gardens. Talk a little bit about what's going on at the Science Museum. Yeah, so um, Science Museum of Virginia, where I work, um, is uh is working on several things right now we're we're a, a co-conspirator for richmond 300 uh rva green 2050 i'm the climate scientist who's always talking about heat and rain and air quality and all that nonsense so you'll see me around i think if you stay involved with those programs but also the city of richmond started doing or we started doing the science museum of virginia we've been setting up um air quality sensors around the city. And I need your help, actually. I'm gonna put this in the chat. RV Air. And I'm gonna put how to join it. Um, we, have, we have air quality sensors to put up around the city. In a sense, for us to be able to understand how uh, kind of gaining some idea of baseline air quality around the city and how as our city continues to grow into the future how does that air quality change does uh do more electric vehicles mean uh, an improvement of air quality in our neighborhoods or does new new development temporarily degrade air quality in parts of the city um so we're we can't do any of the citizen science stuff right now um, but we're, but if you sign up in the join RV Air um, Google form, we can come out to your house or to a business or pass it along to your friends and family, especially if they live on the south side. Um, we don't have any air quality sensors down there yet. Um, network uh, of sensors so we can gain a better understanding of how air quality uh, affects people in, in the city of Richmond. Um, so that's really exciting. We just hired, we have our new community science catalyst on board. His name is Devin Jefferson. He grew up here uh, in Richmond. Um, he used to work for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Richmond. Our star educators at the Science Museum. Uh, the team and uh, you'll see you'll see him coming around eventually. And Duran, I know we need to get you to uh, what we've also been doing is analyzing some of the other uh, stuff going on. So like traffic volumes and sound. Uh, and if, you, if you've noticed, uh, some people have told me like birds sound like they're in stereo. This, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's partially because the background noise of the interstates is almost completely gone, especially at night. And so um, during the same time as our migratory songbird, um, season. We also have the lowest amount of traffic on the interstates uh, and our city streets in, you know, the better part of a decade. Um, so if you're interested, there are some apps. There's one uh, that you can download that's called the Noise Score app. I'll put it in the, um, in the chat too. The Noise Score. 
can contribute. You just go outside and press record and it'll take a, uh, take a reading of your ambient noise. And what we can do is because there's so little background noise right now, we can compare in a year or two years when we're, when we're recovered from this situation, how does the noise change through time? So basically the science museum is just trying to get involved in as many ways to collect data about our natural world. That's, um, that's kind of an update on us. And then I guess the question, uh, Ariel uh, asked, is there a correlation between air quality and airborne viruses? Um, actually, there doesn't seem to be a relationship between the air quality and, uh, and the, the, the viruses themselves. But people that live in areas with worse air quality are at higher risk of having a severe case of this virus. So it's not necessarily that the air quality is causing it. It's the underlying issues related to their respiratory systems that are putting them at a higher vulnerability of symptoms. It's not, a, a, not so much that the air quality means more viruses or anything like that. It's just that the people that live in poorer air quality areas are more vulnerable to the virus and its, and its respiratory problems. Um, but yeah, that is why you can hear bird songs and, uh, and, uh, and the lawnmower. Yeah, I feel like everybody is going outside at different times on purpose just to mow their lawn at different times. Um, there needs to be a next door. That's what we need to do, Duran, on the next door app. We need to say, everybody, just mow your lawn at 7 p.m. And that's it. That's the only time to mow your lawn. Just you, you get one hour from 7 to 8. That's it. For the, you know, for the first time and like, I don't know when, I don't have to get up at like nine o'clock, but the guy next door is like turning it up. Like, uh, I mean. Yeah. He's like, that leaf is not going to stay in my backyard. Get off my lawn. It's just like, it's crazy. It's so funny. So, um, yeah, man. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Man, you are a rock star. Again, I have to give you your kudos. You are the science man. I'm, 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 I'm freaking hyped really, that you come through and make this shit so fucking cool. Yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm so I'm so I'm so happy to call you a colleague of mine, and and all of you that are that are participating in this program, feel free to reach out to me um, and and like try and connect. Especially joining the it, put in an application for this uh, RV Air program. Would love to include you, and uh, and yeah, go to the RVA Green 2050.com and take a look at it. Um, and, uh, it'll be, it'll be really, really fun to, um, to get to, to get to, to meet you all, um, sometime in, in person and, uh, broad and cut shot. All right, cool. Sounds good, Kate. Thank you all. Have a good evening. All right. All right. Peace out, man. See you later. later. Hey guys, I'm gonna go ahead and go grab me some dinner, man. I hope you enjoyed tonight's call. Uh, this is pretty dope. I'm looking forward to doing it one next week. Uh, so, you know, let's take, yeah, enjoy your evening. I'm gonna go grab me a drink. You know what I'm saying? And just relax. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. I recorded this, so uh, I'll be posting it uh, in the uh, Facebook group. So uh, stay tuned for that. Yeah.